Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. I think we're going to go ahead and get started with our program. Thank you so much for joining us on this truly beautiful Saturday afternoon. So thank you for giving us a few hours to be a part of this program. Um, I'm Olga Viso. I'm curator at large and senior advisor on curatorial affairs here at the Phoenix Art Museum. And it's great to just welcome you not only to this talk, but the, to the first public uh, day of the new exhibitions um, that we're opening this weekend. Uh, the key, main exhibition, uh, Juan Francisco Erso por America. And the opening in tandem with several other related exhibitions and installations, including Rainier Levanovo's Methuselah, uh, which is an immersive augmented reality installation that traces the transcontinental migration of a single monarch butterfly in real time. You can experience that in the cat's wing and you're gonna be hearing about it today. We have, we're very happy to have the artist with us. The other exhibition, Lo que es, es lo que ha sido. What it is is what has been, which are selections from the ASU Art Museum's collection of Cuban art. The ASU Art Museum collected, um, has over 200 works by Cuban artists that it collected in the 1990s and early 2000s. And uh, we have a special installation in tandem that helps put Juan Francisco Elsa's work and the generation of artists that followed in context. And these complement another show that just recently opened called Migration Stories that looks at other um, works by Cuban artists um, and local collections here because all that activity and bringing Cuban artists um, at that time uh, in the late 90s and 2000s had a really visible footprint in the collections here um, in the Valley. So we're honoring that and spotlighting that. So again, thank you for joining us for today's talk, uh, which is our artist talk with, uh, and I'm going to Talk, introduce them from the left to the right for our audiences, Tiana Nakia McLaughlin, who is joining us from Philadelphia, Rainier Levanovo, joining us from Houston, Albert Chong from Boulder, Colorado, and our moderator from Miami, Erica Moya James, um, who has been a real close advisor in the Juan Elso uh, exhibition from the very beginning when we began to plan it. Plan it um, and all are going to be in, the artists will be in, in close conversation with Erica to reflect on Elsa's practice, but also the cross currents in their own work um, as uh, artists who are featured um, in this exhibition and, and two of them making new work specifically for it. And I would say in addition to being a thought partner uh, with us on the Juan Elsa show, uh, Erica has written a really beautiful um, essay that delves into Elsa's art, but I think will be a really essential text, just not on his work, but uh, Caribbean art more, more broadly. And so I really urge you to find her words um, and seek it out. We, there is a publication that accompanies the Juan Elsa show. It is not yet hot off the press, but soon will be. And you can actually pre-order it in the museum shop here. Uh, and it'll come out late, later in June. So in addition to my role here at the Phoenix Art Museum, I served as guest curator for this exhibition and I was invited by El Museo del Barrio in New York, uh, which is really the nation's leading uh, museum um, supporting and featuring Latinx art. And so I wanna acknowledge my colleagues who are here from El Museo del Barrio, Susana Temkin, who's in the audience, um, who co-curated this exhibition with me. Thank you, Susana. Um, it's, Amazing to have done and made the show with you in New York, but to be able to bring it here to my home institution, and then it will travel on to Miami in the fall. Um, so the show will have um, different nuances um, and context um, as it moves um, over the next several months. I also want to uh, thank um, Paul Rogers, our Director of Education and um, engagement for really building the robust uh, programs that we have developed um, throughout early September and, and almost the end of September when the exhibition is here. And we hope that you'll um, come, come back uh, and appreciate um, uh, kind of deep dives into different aspects of this very rich exhibition. I wanna thank the staff at the Phoenix Art Museum uh, and Jeremy Nikolaizak, uh, our, our director here at the museum who joined exactly a year ago and has brought such great vision and energy um, uh, to, to the museum and to all the many partnerships that we're, we're building and enriching here. So before we begin, I just wanna acknowledge the funders to the exhibition and help make not only the Elsa show, but all the other companion exhibitions possible. Sue and Bug Selig, the Men's Arts Council, the Virginia Piper Charitable Trust, the O'Patrony Family Foundation, Joan Kremen Exhibition Endowment Fund, and our hotel partner with the Kempton Palomar. And today's art talk is made possible by the generosity of the William Randolph Hearst Endowed Fund for Education Programs. 
So now for the program, um, I thought I would just, uh, and I will get off the stage in a minute, um, but just give a brief context um, for the Juan Elso exhibition if you haven't had a chance yet to walk through the show. So this is the first survey of the late Cuban artist. Um, it's work to take place in more than 30 years. Uh, it brings together all of Elsa's production, which is some 20 works uh, in total, and places it in dialogue with works by over 30 artists, an intergenerational group of artists um, working in Cuba, the Caribbean, Mexico, and across the Americas over the last 40 years. And so it takes this contextual approach um, to uh, looking at this artist's brief um, career, done not even a decade. Um, he died of, of cancer at age 32. And so um, this approach of, of creating a solo show within a group show was a very purposeful one that was taken not only to underscore his legacy despite that short career, but also to address some of the really significant challenges in bringing his works together. Having died so young, the works are very fragile, difficult to lend and also the complexity of US-Cuban relations has made it difficult for works to travel across borders. But we've been able to assemble virtually um, all of his works and brought them here and to create this rich dialogue. And I just would say that relational approach um, was one um, that was really intent on highlighting the major themes in Elso's work, such as the importance of process and ritual in his art his attention to materials and to the symbolic associations and references that they bring, his fascination with the enduring power of myth, the body as a site of ritual and memory, the syncretic nature of Afro-Cuban belief systems, which you'll hear about today, and the prismatic, and I quote um, Erica's words, he's been a great inspiration in, in thinking about how to frame this project and approach it, the hybridizing nature of Cuban and Caribbean and Latin American identity. And finally, this transnational and hemispheric view of the Americas that Elso believed in and, and proposed as, a, as, a, as an unfinished endeavor, um, as a project that's still active and in formation that can be reshaped and reimagined. So I'm gonna, your, our panelists are already on stage, um, but I'll start with just brief introductions and I'll turn it over to Erica. Tiana Nakia McLaughlin is a visual artist, filmmaker, and curator whose work explores and critiques issues of the intersections of race, gender, sexuality, and social commentary. Her interdisciplinary approach traverses documentary film, experimental video, sculpture, and sound installations. More recently, as I think you'll experience in her installation here, her work has explored themes of rememory and narrative biomythography. She's also um, a, a curator and a writer and has been featured in Triple Canopy Platform, Art Forum, Cultured Magazine, Art 21, the list goes on. And she is the recipient of a 2021 Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant. Rainier Leva Novo, born in Cuba, is now based in Houston the last two years, is one of Cuba's leading conceptual artists. His practice challenges ideology and symbols of power, challenging notions of an individual's ability to affect change. His multidisciplinary practice includes mining historical data and official documents, the context of which he transforms into formally minimalist and conceptually charged sculptures and immersive media installations as the one that's featured here. And he is also the subject of an exhibition that will open shortly this afternoon at Lisa Seti Gallery here in Phoenix, The Flowers of My Exile. Albert Chong, uh, born in Kingston, Jamaica, moved to Brooklyn, New York in 1977. He is a fellow of the National Endowment for the Arts. The Guggenheim Foundation has received many awards and fellowships for his work in the visual arts. As an artist of Afro-Jamaican and Chinese descent, his works have explored cultural, ethnic, spiritual, and mystical identities that also reanimates his family history through visual narratives that employ vintage family photographs as the basis for multi-layered still life photographs. And Erica, as I mentioned, uh, uh, is a, an art historian, uh, Dr. Erica Moya James, curator and assistant professor at the University of Miami. Her research centers on indigenous, modern, and contemporary art of the Caribbean, Americas, and the African diaspora. She has received awards, numerous awards and foundation support for her work, including also the tw a 2020 Warhol Foundation Creative Time Writers Grant. Mellon Foundation Research Grant, grants from the Terra Foundation, and she's also a non-resident research associate for visual identities uh, at the Visual Identities in Art and Design Research Center at the Univers University of Johannesburg, South Africa. 
She has a forthcoming book entitled After Caliban, Caribbean Art and the Global Imaginary. So with, without further ado, welcome to our guests um, and to Erica. Thank you for moderating today's conversation. Good afternoon, everyone. I need to take a deep breath, calm down. Uh, thank you for the invitation to share today. I'm going to dive into it because these are amazing artists that uh, the project has brought together, that the museum has brought together today. And I really want us to engage in a deep conversation around their work. But I wanna begin by just sort of framing our conversation. Um, one of the pleasures of working on the Juan Francisco Elso project occurred after I was invited to write um, the essay that, that Olga mentioned uh, for the new publication. For me, it was a dream come true. I had always loved his work. I had seen it in, in Havana. I had seen it all around Miami. Uh, I, 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 there was something about it that really resonated with me on a, very, on a deeply personal and spiritual level. And when I started, I thought for certain that I would write on poor America, you know, that that would be the center of my engagement because there was just something about that piece that um, moved me deeply. But when I began my research, I, right around the time I began, I went to an exhibition in Miami that was curated by Hans Olbris, and he had put it together at, and it was showing at the Miami-Dade um, College. And um, La Fuerza del Guerrero, well, well, The Strength of the Warrior, was featured there. And I just spent a very long time, I, I, stopped, I literally was stopped in my tracks. And I, <laughs> and I spent a very, very long time um, thinking through that work. I later went to see it um, in storage. And to me, it presented an entirely new worldview, a kind of philosophy uh, for the arts of the Americas. And even in this jaded period that we were, we are in, uh, I, I, it really stimulated my thinking. One thing my research made clear was Elso's unequivocal belief in the Americas and that it had everything it needed to, in his words, create epic art. Um, he was deeply engaged with the histories, cultures, materials, philosophies, the faith and, and be, philosophies of faith and being um, in the Americas. And it wasn't about ignoring Western or Eastern cultures, but decentering the authority, the authority of the West, and viewing the world in a very horizontal manner, where things were exchanged rather than um, imp implied or, or directed. He, he wasn't interested in those kinds of hierarchies. And I began uh, my essay thinking of Elso as extending an awareness of the world from the perspective of the Caribbean and the wider of Americas, much like we find in er an early point of encounter um, between Columbus and um, the Americas. And it's a, it's a viewpoint expressed through this image, this object that I have on the screen here. This is a Janus-headed Zemi. Um, it was produced on the island of Hispaniola in the years immediately after uh, Columbus's encounter. Uh, and it was taken away to Europe where it currently resides, it's in Rome. It is one of the earliest known artistic creations by the Taino people, the people that Columbus found thriving on the island of Hispaniola. And it contains materials that materialize this encounter in its epic form. It is made of Caribbean coral and limestone beads, pre-contact cotton, glass beads, and, and, and mirrors from Venice. All right? This is in the first few years after Columbus. And the face is made out of African rhino horn. All right? Its objecthood, its materiality, its form archives a Caribbean artist's encounter with the world. It, is a, it, it demonstrates a syncretic impulse to draw in everything, draw in everything from three continents in its creation, and in a sense, sets a space or place for that encounter that doesn't exist in the traditional archive. It holds a place for a particular moment of history, 
And it tells the story of the Taino's response to their encounter in a way that we you know, need to, in a sense, think about. It also communicates the belief system of this people in the Janus form. It has a head that looks back and forward. And in the use of mirrors, faith, elements of faith, is also embedded in the form. It is a power object. It is a power object that suggests a continuum between Europe on one side and death on the other. Even as the mirrors, when you think about it, suggests an, an attempt to beat this possibility back. You know, They're trying to push against the certainty of death in this form. It is also simultaneously a sculpture, a spell, against Western um, domination. And I also believe it was worn, so it's a performance piece as well. Elso created art in the context of Cuba, Mexico, and the wider Americas. He read extensively. He created and experimented with art materials from nature, art material, regular art materials that we we're more familiar with, carving, um, but every element, every material had meaning and participated in the formation of a whole, much like this anonymous Taino artist did. He drew on his vast knowledge of the Americas and its encounters with Africa and the world as the primary point of departure in his work. As a grounding conversation for our artists that have gathered here, I want each of you to sort of share a little bit um, about the invitation you first received to participate in this very unique exhibition. I want you to tell us a little bit about whether you knew of Elso's work prior to receiving the invitation and what sort of points of connection did you feel immediately once you, you know, decided to contemplate participating, but also um, after you agreed that yes, I wanted, I want to be a part of this conversation that Olga is 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 imagining here, um, and what has you know being a part of the show um, as an interlocutor with his work meant for you as an artist. Do you want to start, Olga? Okay. Oh, get your. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Good to be here. I, I felt completely honored to have been asked anything to do with Cuba. I'm there. <laughs> it's uh, the only, um, I, I, I love that island as much as my own, possibly more. And so there's no way I was going to pass up the opportunity to, you know, to, to be in conversation with Cuban art and with the art of the Caribbean. I, I did not know the work by name. I did not make the connection. But then once I did my research, I recognized some of these works from the past, from my time in New York. And um, it brought back a whole lot of memories. Um, the connection was definitely there. Um, what was the other side of your question? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Erika, for, for the question. And I, I, I say thanks to many people, uh, institutions, during these days in Phoenix. But today I want to, to thank to El Sobadilla uh, for bringing me here through the person of Olga Viso. Um, <clears throat> I met... Also, uh, my connection with Elso is uh, spiritual, more than academic. I met Elso uh, when I was 17 years old, uh, at the same time, the same age that my, my mother died. I met Elso and I admire uh, his work and I was very connected with the way that also uh, work with natural materials, uh, his uh, cosmology, um, but also um, 
I understand through Elso and through my mother the limits of life and was a medium with, uh, with also with death. Um, <clears throat> I, at that time, I did, I made many works uh, uh, in contact with nature, uh, in nature, and I was very, very uh, connected with uh, the Elsa's talks. I use uh, 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 Elsa's personal statement as my personal statement for many years uh, in my career. Um, maybe later I can translate the, the Elsa's statement to uh, with you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, when I got the invite uh, from Olga, I felt like I had done something right in my career. <laughs> to be recognized by someone who is so deeply rigorous and has, um, I think, created uh, foundational ways of entry for artists that I admire, one in particular, um, Ana Mendieta. So I was kind of shook. I even asked my friend, I was like, is this a spam? You know? Like <laughs> but um, I... Um, I I was thrilled that um, I could that my work that I was producing and had produced um, at that time would ever be thought to be in any conversation with an artist um, like Elso. Um, I felt when I did get information about the artist, I had seen the work, I never made the connection of the name. So um, getting more access to a lot of uh, the work and the um, you know concepts and thoughts behind it uh, really put me in a place of thinking about my own mortality first, because I think he, 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 he passed so young. Um, it made me reflect on one of, at the time, uh, an area of my life, my, my spiritual practice um, in a very, very uh, embodied way. Cause I felt like the body of work that he presented was very well executed and very well-rounded. And so um, in understanding what it would be to come in and think about a commission work, I kind of put myself all the way down to square one and went completely into thinking about everything around the senses um, in relationship to my spiritual practice. And it was very much prompted by how I think vulnerable and how gifted he was with handling those materials in his own work. We're going to dive into that in a few moments. Um, but I want to start with Albert. I'm fascinated by the ways in which both you and Tiona really resonate in a very direct way. Um, uh, uh, Santeria, uh, Elsa was an initiate of Santeria. You and Tiona uh, were both involved with Palo Monte and Santeria. And in each case, it, it plays a role in your practice. Um, an awareness of, of these Afro-Caribbean religions uh, and faith systems really directed part of your early, early practice. You were doing the multicultural thing <laughs> in the 80s and 90s when it was accepted, but was, it was also being challenged, right? And at times, artists that were engaging uh, these belief systems were sometimes deemed primitive. I want you to talk about this piece from the, um, from the show and tell us a little bit of how you came to draw on these traditions and perhaps speaking directly to this piece and a few others that I will show. Talk about your connection to faith and pra to this faith and practice um, at the time um, for you personally, but also in relation to the audience as well that you were, you were communicating with through these works? Well, this piece was made in 1982, and I'm so glad that it, it seems to be still relevant. And I thank you so much for, <laughs> for choosing this one. The term, the, the, the title comes from um, a song, a, a, piece, a song by um, The Wailers by Bob Marley, primarily. And I always think of my two earliest influences was Bob Marley and Bruce Lee, funny enough. <laughs> and um, the, 
I had just, I had gotten to New York. I left J uh, Jamaica in 1977. And um, I felt completely uprooted by that immigrant experience. And I, the first thing I did was, um, you know, figure out what my life was going to be. And I was told that you could actually go to school for photography, which was my passion at the time. I didn't know of that possibility. Uh, the expectation was for like the rest of my family and for a lot of people was to go into some kind of business or trade. And I'd come from a business type of family. My parents were shopkeepers, confectioners, and I didn't want to do that. I'm no good at business. And it's bit me in the butt since. But anyway, that's a different story. <laughs> but um, in, in, um, in trying to then figure out what my work was going to be, I, I, I felt that I had to uh, bring, bring Jamaican culture into the mix. And so pretty much at the time, because of um, being feeling displaced, I, there was a reaction to, um, well, how do I put it? I became a militant Rastaf Rastafari, a Rastafarian at the time. And this was the worst thing I could do from, in terms of my, my parents' view. I was disowned by my parents. We talked to them for years. My mother said she was going to kill me in my sleep because Rasta was like the worst thing you could do coming out of Jamaica of that generation. But it felt like this was the way to reconnect, to reconnect with that country. And I was trying to create uh, this idea of a pantheon, a kind of a, 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 a mythology. Uh, spiritual ground that came out of the, the, the mystical aspect of the, of the Rastafari in Jamaica, which is a militant kind of um, somewhat religious spiritual kind of group that, is, that has reacted against the establishment, the colonial establishment in Jamaica. And um, it just felt right. Uh, what also precipitated it was uh, attendance at a uh, uh, Marley concert in, at the Apollo, at which time I've, the, this thing happened where his music um, and the performance kind of resonated so deeply that it suddenly clarified. I felt enlightened in terms of exactly what my role would be in connection to culture, to the Caribbean, and to Africa in itself. And so I started on this quest to try and develop a, my a own my per a personal mystical system. And so I started kind of plumbing the depths of um, my unconscious, you could say. I, I tend to think intuitively. And so I was waiting for the messages to come. And I, I felt that I became sort of the, mess the, the medium through which these works somehow manifested themselves. And so it started out... Um, I'm using this, this background, which is um, burlap in Jamaica. We call it crocus bag. And the early experience with it was my, um, my parents were, were shopkeepers, and I used to go with my father to the sugar warehouses to, to buy sugar. And I remember that smell of this 120-pound bags of wet sugar. And it was such a visceral experience. And just remembering, you know, thinking about this thing as it's the most humble of textiles that you can find for the most part. And so I started kind of saying, well, this would hold the works together. Initially, when I bought the fabric, it was very pressed and smooth and, you know, very clinical in some respects. But I had two cats at the time. And they saw it as like their own personal bathroom. <laughs> and so I had to wash it. And in washing it, it transformed the material. Mm -hmm. And so gave it all these wrinkles, which I thought worked perfectly because then it created this interior landscape mm -hmm. that I was trying to create. I was, I was really trying to, to plumb a connection mm -hmm. between Jamaica and Africa mm -hmm. in these works. And the, the, ter the series was called the Eye Traits. And the Eye Traits at the time, um, it was a reference for me to the... The, the the Rastafarian parlance, you know, the, this term I, 
mm-hmm. and we use I and I as a as a form as a, a form of affection in terms of an extended brotherhood. How did that How did that lead to your exploration of other belief systems in you know Afro Cuban belief yes. systems and other? That happened in around 1979 when my niece was born and um, I became her godfather. Mm -hmm. And there was a naming ceremony for her. And I had to be a a part of that ceremony. And I was moved by the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, a sister and then an aunt all became initiates. Mm -hmm. And the sister became sort of the spiritual guide for the family. And that drew us all in. And I remember making still life of the offerings mm-hmm. um, in the bathroom mm-hmm. and for, for, for her birth. Mm-hmm. And um, that led me to thinking, well, th- this system is well beyond anything to do with Jamaica. I had to go to the origins of the place. And that led me to the, the West African systems mm-hmm. of, of the Yoruba people and ultimately what we Coming out of Cuba originally, Lucume, uh, Palo, Palo Monte, and Santeria. And so um, I generally don't really speak publicly ab- about my involvement. But yes, I did go through s- some, some initiation back in the day mm-hmm. uh, as a, a, a palero. Mm-hmm. And so that's sort of how the, the connections was made. Okay. Looking at this image, looking at... Blessing the Throne from 1993. You know what I'm going to ask you, right? My favorite question, right? (laughs) What am I smoking? No, no. No. Um, You know, I am interested in blur, right? Okay, that question. My blur question. And um, it's a a sort of compositional process-driven effect that I see in the photography of many African diasporic artists, um, Santu Mofeking from South Africa, Adele Gere, a Haitian American artist based in Miami. Um, and I want to hear you talk about your use of blur and its signification, um, what it holds space for, um, spiritually or otherwise, in, in this series of work. Um, yeah, can you speak to that? Yes. Maybe? So these works, um, I, I was... Uh, in New York and, um, you know, working. And whenever I had a, a, a little time off from the job, I was sort of a lab tech at School of Visual Arts. And I, I would have these, like an, uh, you know, an afternoon off or whenever time I would, I would go home, I would meditate for a bit. And of course I would elevate myself with that which will remain unnamed. <laughs> And that then transported me, transcended me to, towards um, being in the proper state of mind. And so I would then, at times, I would walk into the frame, not exactly knowing what would happen. Mm-hmm. And I was relying on this connection, this, this kind of uh, what I call a kind of uh, a personal mysticism, a kind of intuition mm-hmm. to kind of come through. I tend not to work deeply, analytically, or cerebrally. Mm-hmm. And so, with with, um, with with these works, I I would walk in, and then I would then later look back upon the works to see exactly what the narrative was was, and I didn't want to be in complete control of that narrative. I I felt that there was a way mm-hmm. for this intuitive thing to kind of occur, mm-hmm. and so I was then. Uh, collecting um, objects that I call, you know, um, um, objects of power mm-hmm. to, to include in the works. And it is essentially um, w- would kind of um, uh, collect items that I felt to be kind of, have a kind of shamanic power. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. But yes, the idea of the blur, I'm sorry, I didn't get to that. The blur for me was about the intangibility of the spirit, mm. you know, the ephemerality of how that works. So I knew that I could not actually picture the spirit, but I could do it symbolically through that blur in terms of the, the body moving through space mm-hmm. and, and, and through 
through time, that time being anywhere between 10 and 20 seconds of the exposure. One final question for you before um, I slide towards Tiona's uh, work. Uh, has to do with this image here. It's an image of James Hampton, the throne of the third heaven of the nation's Millennium General Assembly from 1950. And um, this, the relationship of this work to this work, but also Elsa. In 1984, um, Robert Farris Thompson was in Havana and he gave this incredible lecture centered on this piece by James Hampton and Ricard Ricardo Bray, Elso, Badia, they were all in the audience and they were completely blown away by this and the implications of this piece. And here we have you. Well, I first saw this work in Robert Farris Thompson's Flash of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And then I was in an exhibition at the, where it was housed. Mm -hmm. And I spent a whole lot of time in front of this thing and not at the opening. <laughs> uh, the reception of the exhibition that I was in, which was a photo. What exhibition. was it about that work? Then? It was this kind of visceral kind of connection to the spirit world. It was his, the intuitive nature of what he was doing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, the story goes was that he was a janitor for the museum and he uh, was collecting these things and wrapping them with tin foil. Mm -hmm. And then one day he didn't show up for work. And they didn't know what happened, and they went to check on him, and he had died. Mm -hmm. And they found in his garage this thing that he'd been collecting. And so, you know, it's, uh, it, it changed my life in regards to another chapter mm -hmm. of how to kind of evolve th this notion of the spirit. Mm -hmm. I want to linger on the notion of spirituality because I want to come to um, Tiona's work. And this is a statement um, that Roberta Smith um, wrote in her article on your work in the New York Times. And she says, like any true artist, McLaudin's work derives from the complex, multifaceted nature of her identity, who she is and has become as a black woman, a lesbian drawn to weight training and BDSM play, a priestess of Santeria. She studied film in the early 2000s, becoming known as an underground filmmaker before turning to video installation and sculpture. That's a whole world, right? A whole range. And just in your willingness to let your ideas flow from all of those dimensions, I think resonates with Elsa in, in that way. But like our friend Albert, you too are in is, a, is an initiate in Santeria. And I want you to speak a little bit to this piece, um, I Pray to the Wrong God for You from 2019, and talk about the ways perhaps that it grounds your, your conceptual art practice and the range and the different materials and how you um, deal with objects. Part of, you are an object maker in um, Santeria. You've been uh, blessed and ordained in that way. Talk about how that make, that grounds you as a human being, but also how it's inseparable from your practice. Yeah, there's a, um, a moment um, in my work where I decided to kind of like somewhat com collapse everything and stop trying to create compartmentalization mm -hmm. based on all the, the things I know myself to be and how I exist in the world. When I got invited to be a part of the um, Whitney Biennial, it was in 2018. And um, I knew that 2019 would be this marker for this like 400 year conversation around um, uh, the legacy of like the transatlantic slave trade. And one of the things that I wanted to think about uh, that was happening concurrently was that spiritually I had been told to work specifically with a particular Orisha. Um, and I had never really put forth work that aligned directly with my spiritual work, meaning that it's like this private practice that I've had to do. But I decided at the time there was no capacity to separate them. Um, so I just took on that particular, you know, um, you know, information that also is like kind of bound um, to the evolution of like my path to 
do work that was also spiritual work that would also um, be something that would be documented for me. So the auto ethnographic element uh, is really what I rooted my entire year of production on. Mm-hmm. So nothing was uh, able to be like, you know, um, I guess untouched or looked at. And there was one moment where the documentation became such an automatic part that I wasn't looking at things at the same time. So there's not like a performance. It would just be like, turn on the camera, turn off the camera, you know, move the files over, move the files over. I Pray to the Wrong God for You is a piece. Um, it's a um, six channel installation with a series of objects. Um, the exhibition install, when it was completed and presented at the Whitney, uh, had it in the actual gallery at my request. I didn't want to be separated from um, a lot of the ways that the museum separate and put video in a black box. I kind of want it to be kind of thrown in the floor. Mm-hmm. Um, but the creation of the work took me um, an entire year to make and documented me making uh, Shango's tools um, from scratch. So I cut down a tree um, in Sc- Skowhegan that fit the same profile of the wood that was needed. Um, dried it and cleansed the wood, um, took the wood back to Philadelphia, went upstate to New York and presented the wood, as well as a harness to a horse there that would be aligned with Shango, um, then brought it back to Philly, then went to uh, uh, Cuba, where I was initiated in 2012, mm-hmm. um, and did a ceremony uh, with my Baba there, who was with other members of my Ile and um, finished and refined the tools there, brought it back to Philly, and then uh, took the uh, tools to um, Nigeria. I flew into Lagos Mm -hmm. um, for three days, didn't tell anybody. My friends still fuss at me for that. Mm -hmm. Um, And traveled to Ibadan, to the oldest Shango shrine that was known to the country that was moved in the earlier parts of war. Mm -hmm. One of the things that guided me was a document that I found that documented the shrine. Um, and it actually framed, uh, was framed around the, the taking of the um, core pieces of that shrine, which now sit in, um, yeah, in Detroit. Mm-hmm. So it was also this conversation about what is ultimately now dominating the art world around repatriation. Mm-hmm. So what I decided to do was kind of take on this element of questioning around, is the, is, am I able to repatriate my own self? Um, and very much interested in the fragility of that and making kind of observations for that uh, because it's impossible. Mm -hmm. But there was this through line that I was very interested in how my religious practice allowed me to evade a lot of um, complications related to other parts of my identity. The image that you have on, I had um, delivered uh, these tools, brought these tools, and was actually... Uh, followed by a group of guys <laughs> uh, to the shrine. It doesn't show up in the um, work. And one of the things that kind of saved me from this particular like harassment was the showing of my elekes, which are a signifier, and they saw mm-hmm. my bracelets that mm-hmm. signified that it was a part of the practice. And then they completely you know, evaporated because they knew that I was there to pray. Mm-hmm. And so I do my um, prayer in front of one of the uh, uh, caretakers of the shrine, and then I go home. Yeah, and so that's like the whole journey is kind of an epic uh, in that way. And I wanted to kind of see, um, I think through the editing process is when I first saw things and I could see a document of a particular, uh, you know, kind of devotion or what one would think of as a piety or a journey of trying to maintain yourself um, despite all, even in your um, most vulnerable part of your, you know, uh, prayer of identity. Do you believe in charge, the charge nature of objects? Absolutely. And how does that sort of flow into your making of these images? I'm going to show a series of images uh, from exhibitions, uh, your exhibitions, and I want you to perhaps link it to the two pieces that are in the exhibition here, mm-hmm. right? But I, will, I want so much from you, and this is a big question. <laughs> This is a big question. I'm going to give you a place to enter it. So particularly this image, we had a really interesting conversation the other day about the expectation of masking. You know, our expectation that usually when we, when we think of masks, we think of performing an alternative 
being or hiding something. But your take on it is slightly different and far more expansive. Um, this piece is also made by you. you. A lot of your work still very much like Elso, you make it yourself. You're not farming this out to other craftspeople. You, your hand, your your touch, your energy is in, you know, very much infused. And he believed that his spirit literally infused the objects that he made. And I see a similar sort, you know, sort of idea emanating from your work. I feel it. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, that idea in the context of this work? It's it's big, um, but also in <laughs> in in terms of how you think about masking here, um, and what some of those ideas from that project. How do how did you link it to the commission work that you completed for this particular exhibition yeah, that we see on the screen? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, Mass Conceal Carry and that work was all made at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the uh, invite for me, I think, came in 2019 to be a part of this project. Um, uh, invite for uh, Mass Conceal Carry came in, I think, 2020. Yeah. And then the pandemic happened. Um, and I agreed to do these things and I had more time. So there was a way for me to go into a slow making which is what I prefer, um, uh, which kind of has evaded the understanding of like how these works came out because like all of last year, it was like back to back to back shows, but I was like, I was going very slow, regular day. <laughs> um, but the, the mask, um, it, it, as it relates to my practice is um, a way to disclose. It kind of is to amplify or push forth a particular um, area of identity. Uh, and Sete Subio Asanto, the image, one of the images that I've, um, uh, that Olga uh, included in the exhibition um, is, a, is a photo that's taken from a larger set of 65. And this is the first time I'm t allowing a photo to be shown outside of that, right? That, that series is me disclosing a particular kind of identity. It's like me actually trying to figure out how to create uh, uh, unstable and a very dangerous image of myself or something mm -hmm. by having signifiers that represent elements of things that people and what I know to not exactly get along, you know, like kind of like complete, like together they create a bit of a chaos. Um, the mask that I made for uh, Mask Concealed Carry is extraordinarily um, rich in its materials. Like I have like real gold, it's made of 10 karat gold and silver. Um, and it was a mask that was made in my figure. Like to make it, I literally had to take it off, put it on. But it was also a mask that was disclosing. Um, I talk about it in uh, the uh, uh, artist statement that I've written for the show, that I, it's the first time I've done a show and I've kept my artist statement back, which it'll be published this year in the book. Um, this mask was um, made in relationship to disclosing or furthering an idea of a gimp mask um, that is usually related uh, or used um, to identify disabled individuals um, across various cultures. Mm -hmm. And so the way that I repurposed it um, was for myself. Um, I have um, autism uh, spectrum disorder and I'm considered um, what you would call low support. So it's a very stealth disability and it also evades a lot of the ideas of like what people see that I'm capable of mm -hmm. and in that moment I want to make a like a very opulent glorious gimp mask one that was almost like so beautiful but it's also like something that is like to disclose and mark me in a very particular way mm -hmm. and so the way that it sat in that exhibit was as like my figure in the room but also like kind of an explosion or amplification of my mind mm -hmm. in the room yeah. I'm willing to jump because yeah. time. Okay. Of course. Uh, and it has to do with all of you, this question of archive. Okay? And um, the idea of archive is really a fraught one for people in the Americas, particularly in those of us in the black and brown people in, in our diasporas. Um, so much of what artists and scholars are embracing as archive today is non traditional. And all of you, Novo included, and Albert, you 
draw on archives in very interesting ways and non-traditional archives. Tiona, talk about the ways in which movement and body and land have played a role in your interpretation of archives in, in, in the context of, your, of, of this work, but also um, this piece that you did uh, on landscape. Yeah, archive is so much a part of my practice that it's become a focus as an object itself or a thing to kind of deconstruct. So a lot of the archives that I've dealt with have started from the more accessible archives that exist within a building like a you know, proper museum, library, archive, have gone to people's homes and things that they maybe hide or are the residue of their passing, posthumous archives. Mm -hmm. But then there's this thing that I'm very fascinated about, the more um, ephemeral, escapable, um, you know, uh, hard to grasp archives. So my piece, uh, Trace of an Implied Presence, dealt with um, black dance and uh, movement and kind of really trying to think about um, the difficulty of the copyright of the body for form and movement as an archive, something that's happening in real time, mm -hmm. um, something that evades a particular copyright, but also has something that you can identify uh, as a form of like writing or as a form of um, place, time, group memory. And um, this kind of work pushed me more into a curatorial. That's where my, a lot of my curatorial process uh, really shines, I think, um, because it, re it requires a particular objectivity uh, to you know, look at it. Play Me Home was me dealing with my own personal familial history, um, starting with just going back to the land that my family still owns, um, that they own from sharecropping onto their own ownership, the McLaughlin Farm that's in Tallulah, Louisiana, and thinking about uh, legacy and what that archive uh, means in terms of also like the family tree, complicating it, making people's narratives meet uh, real based off of land and landscape, which is also something that's always changing mm -hmm. um, and also carries a particular historical fiction tied to its idea of ownership. Mm -hmm. So. Those, those are, that's kind of where I'm at now, is like really getting more into the slippery um, elements of the archive and the hard to capture, just because it's something that um, is, is very fruitful in thinking about how to render that as an object or an image right now. Nova, <laughs> finally. You are all, you're a conceptual artist. Um, we see you, you know, you're singularly described as such but you too engage the archive. Uh, tell us a little bit about your conceptual practice and how you're drawing on that in this particular piece in the show. And Images Archive, Marty, a very important figure, in, of course, in Elso's practice as well. Here you, you were giving us a new twist, a new thing, a new way of thinking about um, this image. But talk a little bit about uh, the ways that you have engaged the archive in your practice. Yeah. I work with uh, archive in uh, different levels, mm -hmm. in different uh, levels of heritage. Mm -hmm. I work with um, uh, almost always with institutions, in collaboration with institutions. I work with, for example, with the original weapons of uh, different uh, uh, founder fathers of the Cuban nation. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the personal weapons of the general, generals who fought against Spain in the uh, independence wars in the 19th century in Cuba. I work with the original partiture of the Cuban national anthem or um, slavery tools used by uh, uh, slaves in Cuba, in the, in the plantation, sugar plantations, mm -hmm. in the 18th and 19th century. I work with archive in many uh, different levels. <clears throat> For me, archives are like the bonds of its history. Um, and in this sense, uh, my practice as an artist is to act as a chi chiropractor of the history, of the social body. Mm -hmm. no? um, 
in this uh, sense, I talk uh, an original bust, a uh, sculptural portrait uh, by um, Juan Jose Sicre. He's a, a, an important um, academic sculpture in Cuba. And I took this bust from the 19, from 1936. Uh, was a very uh, important time uh, in the construction of the, of the collective idea of the Cuban nation. And they uh, uh, use a lot the, 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 the figure of Martí to as a cornerstone to build our idea of, of nation, to unite people, to create the, the, uh, what the country is uh, today. Um, I applied, the idea was uh, applied, uh, many layers of paint, white paint, over the bust, on the bust, uh, to transform what the image of Marti is in a different uh, shape that uh, can, I think, this, uh, this result, the result of this process is a, is a portrait of a Cuban uh, society um, in time. No? Mm. Uh, and is this talk about, uh, is a question about uh, what the 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 things that uh, are shown to us uh, in museums in history in uh, what we can understand on that where uh, what um, what we what we see in in museums uh, what we learn in history is just a, a construction. It's just a, a, a building of of history. You know, in this in this way, I I, I work with a silent space of a history, mm -hmm. uh, and I I work with archive <clears throat> as a as a chiropractor. When you, uh, if I touch your 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 finger, mm -hmm. maybe I can uh, make uh, something in your cervical uh, spine. No, mm -hmm. uh, when I touch archive, I can produce in the social body, in the social uh, uh, collective imaginary. Uh, uh, I can produce a different uh, thing. Is is the way that I am trying to understand the archive in my my work. Yeah, I think um, in your work, particularly in this, like it, it, it's a very poetic way of thinking through history. And you do it in a way, you're talking about very serious ideas, but the way in which you deliver the work, um, you allow us to, in a sense, tussle with ideas that in public we may fight over, <laughs> but uh, they become emergent as we experience the work, you know, through it. Uh, and we can deal with it in a very deeply personal way level. Uh, and I think this piece um, is one of those, is a very eloquent way to talk about ideology and disfigurement of ideas, of um, ideals of nation, of uh, it, in, it, specifically in relation to Cuba, but anywhere, right? This isn't just about Cuba. It's about the process of disfigurement, of, of losing one's sight. And you're doing that in a very interesting way materially through this object. This is another uh, work where called the weight of history. Uh, and here you're using technology and distilling, distilling uh, a lot of these incredible <laughs> texts in, uh, but, but, but speaking to it in a way through um, the process, through the medium, uh, in a way that you're forcing us to think through the weight, literal, the literally, the literal weight of history. But speak, speak to this work a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. This work is a, is is called uh, Five Nights, mm -hmm. 
from the series The Weight of History. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a work that I produced uh, in 2015, mm -hmm. uh, based in a, in a software that I uh, developed with a team of mm -hmm. programmers mm -hmm. and archival specialists. Mm -hmm. uh, we made this software to calculate the amount of ink, not, the, not just the amount, the, the weight, the volume, and the area of the ink used in handwritten or printed uh, documents. Um, the first uh, say uh, that I made with this software, uh, I'll ca I calculate the ink used in five totalitarian books that are the, the, the ideological uh, base of five uh, different uh, totalitarian regimes in, in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the first uh, uh, text from left to, to right is uh, The State and the Revolution by Lenin. Uh, this, the second one is uh, My Kampf by Hitler. The third is um, The History Will Absolve Me by Fidel Castro. The fourth is um, The Green Book by Al Gaddafi. And the fifth is uh, The Red Book by Mao Zedong. Uh, of course, all, all these texts are the base of a totalitarian regime. They have a, a strong impact in uh, those societies and in the world. And what I did was calculate that just the amount of things, the facts of history, the facts of uh, these, those uh, ideologies. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 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 the piece is just ink on the wall. The, the software uh, um, based on digitalized uh, uh, documents can identify the ink in the in the pages and can condense all the ink in a, in rectangles or squares. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, are rectangles uh, proportional to the to the layout mm -hmm. of the of the pages uh, of the the books. Mm -hmm. um, this piece is part of the uh, the way of history series. Uh, that is composed by two another two other uh, pieces. Nine laws. Uh, I calculate the ink uh, used in nine laws of the uh, Cuban history from uh, 1959 to 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, very specific laws that, that can uh, um, tell the, the the history in Cuba of the 60 uh, last years. And the, 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 the third piece is um, the last penalty, is the, the ink used in the penal code, Cuban penal code, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, the articles that regulate the death penalty in Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, this, uh, the series, was uh, collect uh, for three different American institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, the Five Nights is at the Hitcher uh, Art Museum. Nine Laws is at the Perez Art Museum in Miami. And the last penalty is uh, in uh, the world, is at the Worker Art Center in Minneapolis. Uh, we create. It was the, the first time that, that I met Olga in Havana, in the Havana Biennial. And with these three pieces, we create an alliance bet between three, these uh, three different uh, museums. They never were uh, connected before that, because the idea was uh, to keep the, the piece uh, united. and. The alliance consists in you have if you have a uh, one piece of the series, you are the owner of one piece, but you have the right to exhibit the 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 others. And in this way, 
uh, each institution have the right, can exhibit the, the three pieces, and the piece can go together to, to uh, the, uh, the inks. Um, the piece is uh, like a, an agreement, it's, a, it's an statement. Uh, the, the inks only can be printed in, um, on the architecture of the institution. You cannot print the ink on paper or, or canvas. Or, uh, there are very specific ways to see okay. the work and to work with these pieces. But you use that idea in this piece as well, in a way, right? Um, the piece Patria Moreta Iezuka in the the pieces on freedom mm -hmm. and yeah i don't want to <laughs> this in this project is yeah. a, a project by uh, uh, from 19 uh, 2019, 19, yeah. uh, 2019 mm -hmm. in the not the last uh, biennial because the last biennial never happened <laughs> the the biennial before the last biennial um, I made this this project in collaboration with uh, five institutions in Cuba uh, that uh, conserve uh, different uh, materials from slavery uh, uh, time. Um, Cuba was the the mecca of the slavery in the Caribbean, um, and there are. Uh, an important amount of, of pieces that can uh, tell us the, the, the history of slavery um, through this culture, uh, uh, material culture. You know? mm -hmm. I work with three different uh, bodies of materials. Uh, the first was um, um, freedom papers. Mm -hmm. In Cuba, the, the slaves had the possibility to buy their freedom. Uh, it's very different in, in, the, in, in, in other countries. Here in the United States, it was different. In, in Brazil, it was also different. And uh, when you have, as a, as a slave, you have your, your, your freedom depend on a paper mm -hmm. and on the ink. Uh, on this paper is because I, I calculate the amount of amount of ink used in each Japanese. freedom paper. Mm -hmm. The the ink is uh, is propor proportional mm -hmm. uh, to the freedom of one person, mm -hmm. and the the inks mm -hmm. you can see it's like a very small amount, uh, and this is a way to show. To people, uh, the value of the freedom of what of person at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, I also <clears throat> made a, a replics, a yeah. series of replics mm -hmm. of uh, slavery tools mm -hmm. in chocolate. I made molds uh, in extra li liquid uh, silicon. Mm -hmm. uh, Food, uh, great, great. In chocolate, uh, these are uh, replics of those tools. They are very, very uh, precise, very uh, realistic because they are uh, uh, made from the silicon touch, mm -hmm. the steel mm -hmm. of the of the slavery tool it's, uh, uh, itself, mm -hmm. and. Inside these silicone molds, I melt the chocolate to produce pieces that the people can eat. It's a, <clears throat> it's a way to process uh, this tragedy, uh, this very sad history through our bodies. Uh, in a, but through a sweet flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you transform the all the slavery history in a flavor, maybe it's not so sweet. 
but uh, the idea to make to make these objects in chocolate is to to have the possibility to process in our body all this history physio physiologically. It's not just uh, to understand or uh, to see this history intellectually, but in our our bodies. No? Okay. Um, <laughs> I have more questions, but I'm going to hope that give you the opportunity to ask questions right now and hope that you touch on some of the things we didn't even get through. Questions? What? I don't understand the question. Where do you keep the chocolate? Here? Um, no, I produce the pieces for the sh for each. Uh, exhibition for each show. The idea is uh, you can keep the chocolate in your body. Is the the idea? Uh, I I work with the with the uh, Mexican uh, company uh, who produce uh, uh, sustainable chocolate because the chocolate is also one of the uh, contemporary ways to slay people, especially in Africa. Uh, and I, w I work with this uh, specific company to produce the, 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 the tools. So. Other questions? <clears throat> Just to follow on the question of just even making this piece, um, so much of Nevo Talk works with so many collaborators, but also you had to really work with these historians and museum caretakers to give you the permission to let you cast these objects, right? So can you talk a little bit about your process of how you also bring people uh, into your process? Who may not, may not understand or be open to it, but you, how you work? Yeah, uh, to to work with these uh, institutions uh, and with uh, very important objects, uh, you 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 need to have a, an idea, no, a clear idea. No? Uh, in at that time, my relationship with the Cuban government was not very well, because another series of work that I made is called a happy Ser a happy day where I uh, erase the, the image of uh, some political figures, some detectors, and I reconstruct all the image and they never appear anymore. And because that piece, I, my, there was a, a, a tension between the, the, the government and me, but when I uh, present the idea uh, to the to a Minister of Culture, and the, uh, the, the authorities that can uh, let you the, the permission to, to, to work with these specific tools, they said, yes, you need to do it. Yeah, uh, uh, and I said, this, this project is not for me. It's, this project is for, for, for Cuba. This project is for the nation. This project is to, to, to understand the history of slavery in another uh, in a different way, no, and they give me the the the, the right permits to to work with the with the with these uh, materials. I was wondering about the the mask that you made. Um, that I think you indicated that it was um, indicative of like a disability, you know, like identifying a potential disability. But I'm not familiar with um, that tradition or, uh, at all. So can you tell me how you became exposed to it and how did you incorporate it? Did you um, adapt it like to 
uh, like what themes you might have gone with or did you incorporate different cultures that had that? All cultures have a, a, a marking of um, figures that have been deemed outcasts of society, whether it's like putting a bag over their head, um, forcing them in a certain kind of seclusion, uh, seclusionary area outside of society. Um, various cultures in the diaspora have exercised this um, throughout uh, the documented history of this like world in terms of society. Um, it's something that I know of because it goes through uh, this idea of like a mask or a gimp has gone through ideas of abjection all the way to fetish. Um, so on the side of abjection, how it's used to kind of disfigure, I mean, we can go as far as to say like, the you know, the film, The uh, Man in the Iron Mask, it's the same kind of device. Um, it's an imprisonment, it's something to mark people who deliver um, kind of uh, the most brutal violence who have been incapacitated, mentally incapacitated. There's figurations that come up in fantasy works, Game of Thrones, uh, different kind of medieval practices. The person who's the executioner is usually someone who has their tongue cut out and is mass forever, sealed with a lock. It's been used within um, slavery torture devices for members who have um, disfigurations but have also been tried to kind of refigure their purpose, make them do things with this. On the other side of how that goes into fetish, there's elements of that uh, use within um, BDSM uh, community of some people who identify as uh, a gimp, um, as a figure who wants to be played with, uh, a depersonalization tool that they desire, a space for them to go into being just a figure. Um, and so I was very interested in the tension in between that um, and the fact that it kind of ex deals with an element of my own relationship to um, autism is something I have that is, hasn't exactly hindered me in the way that's very legible. Um, oftentimes it's at my advantage, you know, in terms of what it gifts me. Um, so it puts me in this middle ground because I do have to fight for a certain kind of disclosure of the things that people can't see. Um, but I'm also aware of the fetishization of members who are smart or intellectually gifted who are autistic. Um, so the masking for me, I mean, this is the layering of how I usually approach my work is I put everything on the table. I look at the, the full spectrum of things. How is something used in its negative? How is something used in its positive? Um, and then I'm always trying to figure out how to dance in between it. Thank you. I find fascinating how um, artists work in different ways, uh, using different strategies. We have the strategy when an artist tries really to find the, the material history on a, of an object. The, uh, and an artist goes in the opposite direction, like uh, El Chino, <laughs> trying uh, to, to, to produce, uh, to, to materialize history, to materialize uh, something that deals with political memory. So I was really fascinated to see how, uh, uh, how, how what is the shape of, uh, of history. Um, and when, you, when we see something that becomes ink, uh, ink, it has, it has a, a political uh, meaning, but it, it becomes like kind of a, an abstraction and becomes just a shape of ink. On where you have uh, uh, the figure of Martí, who's a political symbol, and it becomes almost like an abstraction, a material abstraction. So I would like just to, to hear that, what is the kind of a strategy you follow when you go from that uh, sense of uh, history uh, or political memory to a material shape. Um, I was, uh, from, my, uh, from my child, uh, I was uh, very fascinated with uh, museum history, uh, historical museums. You know? uh, and uh, it's, there is no possibility to be very creative with history 
because you need to, to, to show the facts, you need to show the history itself through this, those materials. No? Uh, my idea is to, to, um, to transform the, the, my experience, uh, the, the information that I have, the, into a new object, objects that, because the, the history also sometimes is very boring. Uh, but the idea is to, to I, I don't know, to, to, to create some access to another space of, of history through uh, new, new, new objects. No? Um, I, in this sense, uh, I, I made uh, another uh, piece, another works um, related to history who, with a specific um, uh, bottles in Cuba uh, from the 19th century where die uh, the most of the three important uh, generals in Cuba, Jose Martí, Antonio Maceo, and Antonio Ramontes. I, uh, I study the, uh, those uh, combats and uh, I made three perfumes related to these uh, uh, events. The piece is called uh, The Smell of, of War. And I, I work with the uh, perfumists, with historians, to create a, a, a smell uh, that connect you with uh, with these uh, stories, this landscape, this uh, f uh, 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 events, but through your also through your uh, your body. No, uh, it's just an example to 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 show another way to to show the history, to, to exhibit history, uh, to shape history. Uh, because I, I don't I don't I really don't have an, an, an a specific answer for you, Patrick. Thank you. Erica, would you like to make a wrap up? Hand her the microphone. Please. I'll give Albert a moment to um, put together. He wants to make a, a closing statement. But before we do that, I want us, I want to know if each of you can talk about a little bit about movement in your work, the idea of movement and whether it's body movement um, from your dance project, uh, whether it's migration um, in terms of your work, Novo, uh, or movement your personal movement in your compositions, uh, Albert. We didn't get to talk a, a lot about that, but I'm really curious about the sort of, tra you know, what that can mean in terms of the transcontinental movement, transnational movement, uh, philosophical movement beyond boundaries, beyond material, the boundaries of materials, et cetera, in your work. Mm -hmm. um, could each of you talk about a little bit about and motion and migration in your work. Okay. Um, uh, well, in, in regards to movement, um, I, I've been interested in the, the geography of the Caribbean. Um, and the artists that exist in these different countries and the linguistic differences as well as the cultural commonalities as such. So I've seen over the years uh, a connection between specific artists from Cuba, from Haiti, and um, even myself in Jamaica, where there is a sort of brotherhood. Uh, people like Jose Bedia, Edward Duval Carrier from, uh, from Haiti. And I've always thought how, how amazing it would be to actually bring the representatives of these countries and the, 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 
the, the kind of spiritual and religious practice that is common throughout uh, specific artists' works. We really have this kind of conversation. So to me, the movement is not so much physical, but it's kind of um, cultural, it's spiritual, it's, it's artistic as such. Um, For me, I, I, I am, think about it in a personal kind of way of just how I enter the work. I try not to do the same thing twice. Um, most times uh, I challenge myself to kind of reconsider material. So I do have this commitment that um, I pay attention and tend to all aspects of myself as I grow the things that I don't even know yet about myself. Um, so, you know, I'm committed to a diasporic engagement. Uh, because it it has a particular relevance to me in my history, in my spiritual practice. It keeps me kind of honest to myself. Um, and uh, I think that right now I'm very, very interested in the movement of the work that I've produced and making sure that it also is not just circling within an American context. So um, that's taking a lot of uh, purposeful um, <laughs> gestures on my part um, to kind of ensure that uh, the work can move as much as I can. Um, so I have been thinking about um, movement a lot uh, as someone who um, has gotten into the space where I feel that I move more than a lot of the people in my life. So there's like this accountability I feel that I have to try to figure out how to always keep things in motion. Um, at this point, like it's it's helpful uh, in many ways for me to um, not get into a stasis and not get into comfort in a, in a, into a, a comfort because um, there are so many um, folks I think that are in that space. So I'm kind of pushing myself to move more than I feel comfortable with moving. Uh, when you say movement, I I think in in, in political movements in artistic movements, uh, and I think in freedom. Uh, the movement, movement is, uh, is freedom itself, is life. And I, it bring my mind to, to have, I think about my, my, my friend, Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara, who is now in jail, in prison in Cuba, uh, without the possibility to move his body to another place. Because just to call, uh, just to ask about freedom in Cuba. Uh, movement right now for me is, 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 is freedom and is the limitation of freedom. Well, hey, I think you have a picture of Luis Manuel Otero Cantara here. Uh, Luis Manuel Otero Cantara is, a, is an artist in Cuba. He's an activist who is uh, in prison right now um, uh, because the recent, the recent uh, political movement in Cuba uh, he went to, to, to protest to, to the street and the Cuban government put uh, him in jail just for ask for freedom. Uh, and this is, this is movement for me right now. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you for taking the time uh, to engage with these ideas. Um, thank you, Olga, for inviting me to be a part of this project. I'm deeply honored. I was very much like you, Tiona. I'm like, what did I do in my life, right? <laughs> and, and things just keep getting better and better. If you haven't seen the show, I do invite you to go into the galleries before you leave. And if you can, pull some of these artists along with you. So if you if you want to have a direct conversation with them on their works that are, are, are in the show. Thank you for coming. Good evening.
Before we let you go, I just wanted to acknowledge another artist that's in the show that's here with us who's been in the audience, Magali Lara, who's joining us from Mexico City and has um, been the steward of Elsa's art. Um, Elsa was her late husband and has been just a beautiful collaborator and a really powerful artist, and we're so honored to have you here. And she will be in conversation on a virtual program um, July 19th with um, Mexican curator Cuauhtémoc Medina, talking about Elsa's very important influence in Mexico. So we hope you'll come, come back and participate this summer and, and throughout. So thank you for being here. Thank you to the artists, to Erica. Um, enjoy the show. Great to have you here.